So this has been in the pipeline for quite some time and I thought I would just go around and get it done. Grab a piece of paper and let's go. Hello and welcome to MK's medical review series. My name is Dr. Moses Kazevu. This is a series on my YouTube channel where we look at medical topics in depth. Today we're going to be looking at pretty much organophosphate and carbamate poisoning. If you haven't yet subscribed to the channel, please hit the subscribe button, hit the bell notification icon to be receiving notifications of such videos every time I post. Grab your piece of paper, grab your pen, and let's go. So usually in the gist of my new series, I will start off with pretty much a warm-up question. So this is an essay, right? Short notes on symptoms, signs, and diagnosis of organophosphate poisoning. As simple as that. So remember that pretty much your organophosphates and carbamates are going to be found in many compounds. Most commonly, they're going to be found in insecticides, and they're going to be a common cause of poisoning they cause over a thousand deaths annually uh, in developing countries. And of course, intoxication can happen because these organophosphates can be ingested in the body. They can be present in the body through inhalation, so through the lungs, and they can also pass through the skin. That's the, the bad part about these organophosphates. So they can be uh, intoxication that's happening through ingestion via the GIT, through inhalation via the lungs, as well as through the dermal absorption that's via the skin. And because these things are very lipophilic, it means that they're going to be stored in the fat. So it means that they can be kept as a depot for a very long time, such that even over periods of days, you would have these symptoms manifesting. Now, how are these going to be working? Remember that organophosphates and carbamates are pretty much going to be inhibiting an enzyme that's known as acetylcholinesterase. Now, remember that the whole goal of this enzyme is to break down acetylcholine to abolish the functions of acetylcholine at the different neuron to neuron junctions as well as the different neuron to muscle junctions. Now because you inhibit this enzyme acetylcholinesterase, there's going to be accumulation of this acetylcholine at central as well as peripheral cholinergic endings, including the neuromuscular junction. Now remember that many of these organophosphates are going to require biotransformation before they become active and so some features may actually be delayed before you actually um, see certain clinical features after being poisoned. Now, the metabolism that's going to be there associated with these organophosphates and carbamates is pretty much oxidation and hydrolysis by the esterases enzymes as well as a reaction by glutathione. And elimination of most of these organophosphates is pretty much going to be happening mostly in the urine, but to a lesser extent it's going to be ex expired in the air as well as passed out in the feces. Now, what exactly is the pathophysiology? I already alluded to this earlier on. Remember that you have acetylcholine that's going to be there to the, the autonomic ganglion. Remember that all autonomic ganglion, regardless of whether they are sympathetic or parasympathetic, they are going to have acetylcholine. Acetylcholine is also going to be present at the terminal post-ganglionic parasympathetic nerve fibers at motor end plates, so pretty much the ones that are going to be innervating skeletal muscle, as well as also some cranial nerves. So it means that all these things are going to be affected. And remember that there are different muscarinic and nicotinic cholinergic receptors that are found throughout the body, that are found in the CNS, that are found in the peripheral nervous system as well. Now, these organophosphates are going to be binding irreversibly to acetylcholinesterase, which is the enzyme that's going to be responsible for the breaking down of acetylcholine. Now remember that the carbamates can actually be cleared spontaneously within about 48 hours and when this enzyme is inhibited it's no longer going to be breaking down acetylcholine at the central as well as the peripheral nerve endings so it means that acetylcholine is going to accumulate at these areas and this means that there's going to be a lot of acetylcholine stimulating the muscarinic receptors, there's going to be a lot of acetylcholine stimulating the nicotinic receptors. 
So here is a high yield table to actually help you with the different receptors that are there and the different effects that you get. So there's muscarinic receptors, M1 up to M5. Then there's nicotinic uh, neuronal and nicotinic muscular. So there's a NN and there's a NM receptor. So let's look at the muscarinic receptors first. So we'll start with M1. Remember that M1 is going to be found in the CNS neurons. It's going to be found in the sympathetic postganglionic neurons. And some presynaptic sites are going to be also be found, uh, some M receptors, M1 receptors are also going to be found in the stomach. So these are going to be responsible for gastric secretion. They're going to be responsible for increasing or enhancing cognitive function. So pretty much improving memory and as well as gastric uh, acid secretion. So remember that this is a GQ coupled receptor. Remember that GQ coupled receptors are going to be associated with inositol triphosphate and diacylglycerol. I don't want to go into details of that. It's more pharmacology. We will cover that on our pharmacology lectures on the channel. Then, so the effects of this muscarinic 1 receptor is pre pretty much enhanced cognitive processing, which is going to be leading to things like enhanced memory and even increase in gastric acid secretion. Then when we look at the muscarinic 2 receptors or the M2 receptors, these are going to be found predominantly on the myocardium as well as the smooth muscles. So these are going to be a, a G inhibitory coupled receptor. So that means that when they open, a potassium, uh, or when they are stimulated, a potassium channel is going to open. And this is going to inhibit your adenylocyclase. So these are going to be decreasing the heart rate. They're going to be decreasing the force of contraction. They're also going to be decreasing the uh, AV conduction. So it means that if you stimulate these receptors by your acetylcholine, you'll slow the heart rate. So one of the things that we see in organophosphate poisoning is bradycardia. If we give an antidote to this, we would expect the heart rate to increase. So it means that your effects of atropine are going to be an increase in the heart rate. And of course, muscarinic 3 receptors are found on many organs, many viscera, so they're going to be found on exocrine glands, they're going to be found on the vessels of smooth muscles and endothelial muscles, on the eyes, especially the iris circular muscles and the ciliary muscles. Now these are IGQ coupled receptors, just like with the muscarinic 1, they're going to be associated with IP3, and they're also going to be associated with diacylglycerol and as well as an increase in intracellular calcium. Now remember that when these are stimulated, number one, they're going to increase the GI secretion. So you would see that there's a lot of secretions that are going to be produced in someone who has organophosphate poisoning. Not only just the GIT secretions, but even the respiratory secretions. They'll be foaming at the mouth, they'll be bronchorrhea because there'll be some bronchial obstruction. It also stimulates contraction of the smooth muscles, especially in the walls of the bladder, in the GIT. So this person may have a fecal incontinence, they may have a urinary incontinence, and of course there's also going to be relaxation of the sphincters that are supposed to be guarding these areas, leading to the incontinence. Now remember that the parasympathetic nervous system which is mediated by acetylcholine is pretty much going to be causing di um, constriction of the pupil, right, because rest and digest is the uh, parasympathetic nervous system, so you need to actually decrease the size of the pupil, you don't need as much light entering into the eye. So it means that when you stimulate this person with these um, acetylcholine from an organophosphate poisoning, they're going to be having constriction of the pupil, which is meiosis. And the opposite is supposed to be true when we give an antidotal treatment to this patient. The pupil is supposed to dilate, and that's one way in which we check. We check the heart rate, we check whether the pupil is dilating. That's how we see that this patient is improving. Then, of course, the ciliary muscles are also going to contract, so uh, the lens is going to broaden, and this is for uh, accommodation for neovision. Then, of course, muscarinic type 4 and type 5, don't really worry about them. They are pretty much found in the CNS neurons in the terms of muscarinic 4 receptors. They are also found in the vascular endothelium as well as cerebral vessels in the terms of muscarinic 5. Uh, M4 receptors are going to be GI or G inhibitory uh, coupled receptors and M5 are going to be GQ coupled receptors. These are, when M5 is stimulated, they'll synthesize a lot of endothelial derived relaxation factor which is also known as nitric oxide and it's also going to be causing cerebral vasodilatation. Now with the nicotinic neuronal uh, receptors or the NN receptors, these are going to be found in post-ganglionic neurons, some presympathetic cholinergic terminals. And once these are going to be stimulated, they're going to be causing opening of the sodium potassium channels and of course depolarization in the postsynaptic neuron. So these are very important actually in transmission of an impulse across a neuron synapse. So they are needed for transmission of action potential. So it means that if they are overstimulated, this could lead to things like vasculations, tremors, okay, even sustained contraction that may lead to paralysis. 
then the nicotinic muscular uh, receptors are going to be found in the skeletal muscle and uh, neuron end plates when these are stimulated the open sodium and potassium channels and cause depolarization as well so this is going to be an increase in the muscle tone i hope you keep this table in mind because this will help you now learn the different symptoms that we see in patients that have organophosphate poisoning so what are the clinical features that we see so someone who's poisoned is going to be anxious there'll be some anxiety they will have some restlessness they will have some tiredness and even a headache so there will be some features of cholinergic muscarinic activation so things like nausea vomiting abdominal colic diarrhea tenesmus sweating hypersalivation chest tightness and meiosis there will also be some nicotinic effects like muscle fasciculation flaccid paralysis of the limb respiratory muscles and uh, occasionally even some extraocular muscles now the respiratory failure can actually be seen with this condition because there will be some bronchorrhea there will be some pulmonary edema that may actually develop and the intermediate symptoms usually become established about two to four days after exposure so it's quite acute in the case of organophosphate poisoning and of course the signs of acute cholinergic syndrome are no longer obvious after this now the characteristics of the syndrome are of course going to be weakness of the respiratory muscles remember the diaphragm the intercostal muscles the accessory muscles in the neck as well as the proximal muscles and then accompanying the features or accompanying features often are going to be including things like weakness of the muscles that are innervated by some cranial nerves remember some cranial nerves innervate some muscles and of course there may be a delayed polyneuropathy which is a, a late or rather a rare complication of acute exposure to this uh, organophosphate insecticides and it's going to be initiated by pretty much phosphorylation of these uh, subsequently aging of at least 70% of the neuron or neuropathy target esterase in peripheral nerves. Now, how do we make a diagnosis? So to confirm this diagnosis, of course, you get your clinical history, the features on physical examination. You can measure the amount of erythrocyte cholinesterase activity. So it's in asymptomatic patients is about 30 to 50%. In those with moderate poisoning, it's about 10 to 20 percent. And those that are severe poisoning, you get an activity that is actually less than 10 percent. Alternatively, you may order for a plasma cholinesterase activity. It's less specific, but it may also be depressed. Other investigations to order for include a full blood count, urea and electrolytes to rule out electrolyte disturbances, stool, microscopy, culture, and sensitivity to rule out gastroenteritis, because this person may have come in with a fecal incontinence and they may have soiled themselves. And they may also be vomiting with abdominal pains so that may be similar to gastroenteritis now how do we treat these patients remember this is an emergency it's a poisoning so the diagnosis is paramount so we assess the vital signs we are certain as far as possible the nature the quantity of the poison and when it was taken and of course the treatment is aimed at slowing down or reducing or preventing further absorption of the poison and counteracting the effects of the poison so it means that if the patient comes in you have to remove their clothes, you have to bath them, you have to remove anything that was soiled on them, anything that is contaminated has to be removed from this patient. So you want to resuscitate your patient with your ABCs. So in this case, the airway is very, very important. So we clear and secure the airway. So we pull, you may pull the tongue forward, be careful, you may actually be bitten. So you may actually even perform those jaw thrust and the chin lift maneuvers. If there are any dentures, remove the dentures. Uh, if there are any oral secretions, suction the oral secretions. You may also use an oral uh, pharyngeal airway if possible to keep this open. Keep the patient in a semi-prone position. So keep them propped up because there is a huge risk of aspiration in these patients. You suction all the secretions and ensure that the patient is breathing. If they're not, give them oxygen, continuous oxygen. Make sure that the oxygen saturation is above 92%. You can elevate them from nasal prongs to, of course, your oxygen mask your non rebreather mask depending on whatever is going to be working for you and monitoring the oxygen saturations as you are given the oxygen of course this is a multi disciplinary thing so you should call for help you can't do this alone and of course apply assisted ventilation with the ampule bag if need be do not use any respiratory stimulants they're going to cause harm gain venous access send blood to the labs for your fbc your cross match your unes your lfts and if your lab does cholinesterase activity, you can send for cholinesterase activity. You start running your IV fluids, your normal saline. Remove the clothes that were soiled. Now for mild cases, these, they require no specific treatment other than removing of the soiled clothes. 
then for those that are symptomatic, we can give atropine 2 to 5 milligrams in children. We give a dose of 0.05 milligrams per kg in children. And remember that most of these organophosphate poisoning happen in the setting or in the background of an individual being heartbroken or there's a problem at home, then they decide to end their life by taking DOOM, which is an insecticide which has some organophosphates in it. So we want to give atropine 2 to 2 milligrams to about 5 milligrams. We should be giving this every 5 to 10 minutes until we see signs of atropinization. Now these are the signs that I told you about. So the dose is going to be doubling every 3 to 5 minutes. For example, if we start with about 2 milligrams, the next time you're going to give uh, another 2 milligrams, or rather 4 milligrams, that's going to be uh, double you double the dose every three to five minutes until the patient is atropinized. How will we know that they're atropinized? So the skin is going to be flushed. It's going to be dry. The pupils will dilate. This is a very important thing that I told you about earlier on. The pupils will begin to dilate. The, and the bradycardia is going to be abolished. So there's going to be a fast pulse. Okay, so there's going to be an increase in the heart rate. Then of course, the frequency of administration pretty much depends on the severity. Some people may be given a quite a large dose of atropine. And of course, symptomatic patients must also be given an oxime, such as an oxime, rather, such as pralidoxime. And this is obviously to reactivate the inhibited cholinesterase. So we can give pralidoxime chloride, 30 milligrams per kg, as a slow IV injection, followed by an infusion of pralidoxime mesylate, 8 to 10 milligrams per kg per hour. So this is pretty much how we're going to be managing organophosphate patients. So back to our essay, write short notes on signs and symptoms as well as diagnosis of organophosphate. So the symptoms include anxiety, restlessness, tiredness, headache, muscarinic symptoms include nausea, vomiting, abdominal colic, diarrhea, tenesmus, sweating, chest tightness. Nicotinic effects include flaccid paralysis of the limbs. Then of course signs are going to be including things like meiosis, hypersalivation, lacrimation, fecal, and urinary incontinence. Nicotinic um, effects are going to include things like muscle fasciculations, respiratory, extraocular muscle paralysis. Diagnosis is by your erythrocyte cholinesterase activity, which may be decreased to 30 to 50% in asymptomatic patients, 10 to 20% in moderate poisoning, less than 10% in severe poisoning. Then, of course, your plasma cholinesterase activity can also be done, but is less specific. Then other investigations are going to include things like a full blood count, urea, and electrolytes. So remember, the management is pretty much your ABCs, remove the soiled clothes, and then also give them atropine until they're atropinized. And of course, you may also give them oxymes to reactivate the acetylcholinesterase. I really hope you enjoyed watching this as much as I did teaching it. And if you did, please drop a like, drop a comment. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel. My name is Dr. Moses Kazevu. See you in the next episode. Until next time, bye-bye.